in our lecture series here. Um, and this is a really, 2023 is a special year for us at the observatories because this is the beginning of our, what will be an 18th month celebration of Edwin Hubble's discovery of the universe, as many of you may know. Yes, big, yes, there you go. It was uh, in October of uh, 1923 when he took the first data and then he spent most of uh, 1924 collecting more data and announced, it was announced kind of publicly to at least the astronomers on January 1st, 1925, that the universe had effectively been discovered as we know it. What this really was was just the measurement of the distance to the Andromeda galaxy, which was the first time we knew that there were external galaxies like the Milky Way. And you'll hear more about external galaxies later in the series, uh, particularly in the next lecture. But um, anyhow, so this is an exciting, and we'll be celebrating this throughout the year, so I just thought I would start by mentioning that. Hubble came to, uh, to Carnegie in 1919, uh, just a few years after he had finished his PhD. And so one of the things we've done in our entire history, uh, back to 1904, is really highlight uh, young scientists. We really are a place where young scientists can come and, and uh, really prosper. Uh, these days we have what I will argue is the strongest postdoctoral program in the country uh, for astronomy and astrophysics. This is where young people finish their PhDs, they, they come to Carnegie, get a few years of experience and then go off and be faculty members at, at uh, various places around the world. And so this year we decided we would celebrate um, our postdoctoral fellows. And so in fact our entire series are, well three of them are current postdoctoral fellows, uh, starting with tonight's. And the fourth one is a very special previous postdoctoral fellow, Jane Rigby. And Jane has been in the news a lot for the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which many of you may have seen the 60 Minute special last night on the James Webb. And many of you may have heard, I've been giving zillions of talks about James Webb throughout town. You probably have heard one of those. And so uh, Jane, though, is really embedded in the project and working at Goddard, so that'll be super exciting. And she was the fellow, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or something at the observatory. So she'll be, she is, in fact, our next lecture, which before I forget, let me remind you that tickets uh, for the next lecture will become available tomorrow at 10 a.m. We did sell out this time. Not everybody shows up, and so we were able to get the waitlisted people here. But I do recommend, uh, especially since Jane is in the news a lot, that that will probably be a very popular lecture tomorrow at 10 a.m. Um, okay. So let's see. Let's get on to today's uh, speaker. Oh, a few, th few things first. Let me also acknowledge um, our folks here at the Huntington for uh, hosting us. They always do such a great job. I want to thank all of our Carnegie volunteers. You saw many of them here uh, collecting your tickets. Every year, the, uh, our young folks help uh, support our series doing that. I want to acknowledge the Norris Foundation, which provides funding for this, allows us to rent this space from the Huntington and use it. It's a really quite spectacular space. Now I can get on to today's speaker. So today you're going to hear from uh, Kyle Kramer. Um, Kyle did his undergraduate work at Northwestern. Uh, he then, when he finished, uh, it was a double major in uh, physics and music. And then he had to decide which direction he would go. So he came back to Southern California, went to Coburn, which we've just heard a lot about, I know, got a master's degree in music. After that, he decided to go kind of uh, go back to astronomy, and he went back to Northwestern where he got his PhD in astrophysics. Um, and after the, he completed his PhD uh, in 2019, uh, he came back to Southern California, this time as a prestigious NSF fellow uh, at Caltech and Carnegie. So he's one of our joint fellows in our uh, renewed partnership we have at Carnegie with Caltech. That's why you see Caltech and Carnegie there. Um, Carnegie should be on the top. I already, he already pointed that out to me. <laughs> But that's okay, we'll let, we'll let Kyle get away with that. But in this new partnership, he splits his time between these two, of course, amazing astronomy uh, places. And then um, just last year, he was awarded a prestigious NASA Einstein Fellowship, and so, which will continue his stay here in Southern California, once again, split between um, Carnegie and Caltech. And so, um, so you know Kyle's work's pretty good if he's, he's doing, getting these prestigious fellowships at such great places. And Kyle works in the area of compact objects, and you're gonna hear all about that today. This is, of course, a super exciting field, particularly with the gravitational wave detections from LIGO. Many of you have heard about these through the last few years. Um, and, and so you're gonna just be in for a treat today. Uh, so with that, let me, uh, help me welcome Kyle to the stage. Kyle. There he is. All right, thanks, uh, John, for the nice introduction, and thank all of you for being here tonight. It's a pleasure to be able to give the first uh, lecture of the season in this really uh, great series. So um, I am an astronomy theorist, 
which is basically a fancy way of saying instead of staying up late and actually observing objects out in the night sky, I get the easy job. I get to work normal hours and never have to stay up too late. And I build simulations of these various objects on a computer. So tonight um, we are going to be discussing these really amazing systems called globular clusters. So this image here is um, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. This is one of the many globular clusters in our own Milky Way galaxy. And I would say the defining feature of these clusters, as you can see very clearly from this image, is that in their centers, the stars are packed together really tightly. The densities in their cores are unbelievably high. And as I'm going to talk about throughout uh, the lecture tonight, when stars live within the dense centers of these clusters, many really exciting things can happen to the stars that would never happen to stars like the Sun, which lives in a much more normal, less extreme, less dense part of the galaxy. So to give you an idea of how dense these clusters are, let's zoom in on the core of one of these clusters. So for a typical globular cluster, the core has a radius of around one parsec. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with what a parsec is, a nice rule of thumb is this is just about the same distance as uh, the distance from the sun to our closest stellar neighbor, Proxima Centauri. So if we imagine we took the sun and we plopped it down in the center of a globular cluster, Pro Proxima Centauri would be right around here. So this is pretty cool, I think. Within our own stellar neighborhood where the Earth and our solar system lives, the volume enclosed by a single parsec contains two stars, the Sun and Proxima Centauri. But in one of these globular clusters, this same volume contains tens of thousands of stars. So these objects are many thousands of times denser than our own stellar neighborhood. Okay, so globular clusters are really dense. They are also really old. The globular clusters in the Milky Way contain some of the oldest stars in the galaxy. Some of the stars in these globular clusters are actually almost as old as the universe itself. So a kind of quick way to judge the age of a star is by looking at its color. So really old stars are generally a little bit lower in temperature and they emit light that's mostly red in color. And indeed, if you look at this image, I think characterizing most of the stars as red is pretty fair. Now, for those of you in the audience who are perceptive, you might say, oh, there's a few blue stars in here too, and that's correct. Actually, all globular clusters contain a handful of these blue stars. And these blue stars are actually really cool because they hint at some of the interesting gravitational interactions that are happening in these environments. So when you take two old, cold red stars and you merge them together, as sometimes occurs within these really dense systems, then the merger product of these stars becomes hotter and it starts to emit more bluish light. So these blue stars are simply older stars that have been rejuvenated through collisions with other stars. And these collisions are enabled specifically by the really dense environments that these stars are living in. So incidentally, it was actually a Carnegie astronomer, Alan Sandage, who's sort of one of the more iconic Carnegie astronomers from the 20th century, who actually studied these blue stars. They're called blue straggler stars. And he catalog, uh, cataloged these stars in many of the Milky Way globular clusters. So I'll come back to these stellar collisions a bit later. Okay, so globular clusters are old and they're also very dense. So the next question is where can we find these populations? So this here is a simulated uh, side-on view of the Milky Way. So you can see we have the disk of the galaxy, which is where our sun and the Earth live. In the center, you have the galactic bulge, and then out in the halo of the galaxy, we find our globular clusters. So in the Milky Way, there's roughly 150 globular clusters that have been observed. Now, there's probably something like another 50 or so that are actually hidden from the Earth because they lie on the other side of the bulge. So the bulge is really bright, so it's hard to see objects on the other side from where we are in the, in the galaxy. So in total, you probably have something like 200 globular clusters in the Milky Way. And each of these 200 clusters itself contains approximately a million gravitationally bound, very old stars. So these clusters, though, are not unique to the Milky Way. It's now pretty well understood that essentially all galaxy types contain globular clusters. 
So this spans from the lowest mass dwarf galaxies, which contain maybe a few to a few dozen clusters. Spiral galaxies like the Milky Way, also like Andromeda, which is our closest galaxy neighbor, contain a few hundred globular clusters. And then on the high mass side, we have the large elliptical galaxies, like for instance, M87, another galactic neighbor of the Milky Way. And these large ellipticals contain tens of thousands of globular clusters. So these are common amongst all galaxy types. Now these galaxies I'm showing here are all relatively local universe galaxies. They're kind of close to the Milky Way and this is how we can observe them and observe their globular clusters very well. But over the past few years, we've also begun to observe and discover globular clusters in very distant galaxies way out in the depths of the universe. So I think this next part is really cool. This is maybe one of my favorite parts of this talk. So um, some of you may have heard of this new exciting instrument called the James Webb Space Telescope. So um, this is sort of the successor to the Hubble Telescope, which has sort of been the instrument of astronomy over the past 30 years. And almost certainly James Webb is going to be similarly prolific. So some of you might have seen some of these really amazing deep field images taken by the James Webb Telescope. So here the telescope is looking out billions of light years into the depths of space and each blob of light in this image is a very distant galaxy. So if we zoom in on one of the galaxies in this image, you can see surrounding the galaxy these small little circles of light. And these little circles are actually, we think, globular clusters. Now, some of you may have heard before that when you're looking at very distant galaxies, the light that's emitted from these galaxies takes a really long time to travel all the way from the galaxy that it starts in to us here on Earth, where we capture the light with our telescopes. So when we're looking at these distant galaxies and also these distant clusters, we're not only looking really far away, we're also effectively looking into the past. We're looking at these galaxies and these globular clusters when they were much younger. So these globular clusters, like the ones that we've seen with James Webb, are kind of like the childlike versions or the baby versions of the very old globular clusters that we observe in the Milky Way. So one of the main science goals of the James Webb Telescope is to actually observe these very young and distant globular clusters and sort of use this data alongside the large amount of data of old clusters we have from our own galaxy and use these to sort of piece together our understanding of how these globular clusters evolve throughout their entire lives. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is sort of zoom in on an individual star that might be living in a globular cluster. And I want to talk about some of the things that one of these stars might experience because it's living in one of these dense environments and sort of contrast this with stars like the Sun, which are very much not in a globular cluster. So here we have the sun. The sun is a single star. As I mentioned before, the closest star to the sun, Proxima Centauri, is very far away, basically nowhere close. So the sun, for the most part, is able to just sort of live on its own. It's not really perturbed by other influences surrounding it. So unlike the sun, roughly half of the stars out in the galaxy are actually members of binary star systems. So these are pairs of stars that orbit around their mutual center of mass and are gravitationally bound together and sort of live and evolve together throughout their lives. So we've increased the complexity a little bit. We have two as opposed to one. But for the most part, these binary systems are still relatively straightforward. Their evolution is still pretty simple. Most of these binary stars are very wide, so the stars don't really interact with one another. They orbit each other, but generally speaking, the two stars are still sort of able to live their life on their own and not really um, interfere with, with one another. But in a globular cluster, where you have many stars that are packed together at very high densities, these stars or binaries that are in the cluster are very close to other nearby stars. And occasionally these stars can wander nearby stars that are also in the cluster. And once you start involving three or four or more stars in these gravitational encounters, things start to deviate from these simple, straightforward orbits and you start to get quite a bit of chaos. So let's show a simulation of a single star, like maybe the sun, for instance, that lives in a cluster and happens to wander nearby a binary star that's also in the cluster. So now we have three objects and you can see the orbits are completely chaotic. You don't have these stable orbits. Occasionally you have temporary stable states, but overall, it's pretty exotic. 
So you can have the initial binary exchange partners, the single star becomes bent in a binary, and occasionally also during these many passages, you can even cause the stars to collide with each other. So for instance, like I mentioned, those blue stars we saw before, we think could be remnants of these stellar collisions. So all of this chaos, all of these interesting gravitational interactions are enabled by living in one of these really dense stellar clusters. Okay, so what I wanna do next is take this basic picture and I'm gonna show a computer simulation of a sort of a full cluster that takes into account all of these gravitational encounters that are happening between all of the stars at once. Okay, so a few things I wanna sort of draw your eyes to. So immediately, if you just sort of look at this as a whole, you're sort of struck with how dynamic these systems are, how incredibly active the stars and their orbits are. But another fun thing to do, if you just pick a single star anywhere in the simulation, it doesn't matter which one, and you sort of watch the star as it orbits, you'll notice that the orbit eventually completely changes direction. So this happens because of these strong gravitational encounters between stars with other stars and with other binary stars. And in fact, the cumulative effect of these many perturbing encounters is actually what causes these systems to relax and settle into this spherical globular shape, which is why they get their name, globular clusters. So the other thing you'll see that's very striking in the simulation is occasionally you have these stars that expand briefly into sort of giant stars and then disappear. So to figure out what's going on here, we're gonna take a very brief detour into stellar evolution and talk about how stars evolve over their lives. So stars, um, the evolution of stars is essentially a balance between forces. So you have gravity, which tends to compress all of the matter inward. And then you have uh, internal pressure force that's created by the large amounts of energy created through nuclear fusion in the hot stellar interior. And this pressure pushes outward against gravity. And for most of the star's life, you have equilibrium between these two forces. So this is why stars like the sun are able to basically be static objects for a very long period of time. You have equilibrium between gravity and this internal energy pushing outward. But eventually the internal nuclear fuel is used up. And at this point, as sort of a last uh, gasp of life, as the star burns through its final amount of nuclear fuel, the star reaches really high temperatures in the center and it expands into a red giant star, like we saw before. Now, eventually, the nuclear fuel is exhausted entirely, and at this point, there's nothing to prevent the collapse of gravity, and the center of the star, the core, collapses. So for stars like the sun, as we showed in this particular animation, the final fate of the star is for the center to collapse into something known as a white dwarf star or a white dwarf remnant. So a white dwarf remnant is the final fate of something like 99% of the stars in the universe. Most stars in the universe are low mass like the sun. They'll end up forming white dwarfs. But for more massive stars, so stars that are 10, 100 times as massive as the sun, things get a little bit more fun, a little more catastrophic. So here the internal temperatures become high enough to trigger not only expansion to a giant, but ultimately also a supernova explosion where the outer parts of the star are violently flung outward into space. And the gravitational pull, the mass of this final stellar core is so massive that it collapses further beyond even that of a white dwarf and either a black hole or a neutron star forms in this case. So black holes and neutron stars are the final evolutionary phase of the most massive stars in the universe. Okay, so these are sort of our three final stages of stellar evolution, the three different compact objects, we call them. These are the densest stars in the universe. So again, the lowest mass stars like our sun will ultimately form white dwarfs. White dwarfs have a mass comparable to the sun, but are much more compact. They have a radius similar to that of the Earth. Denser still, formed from stars something like five to maybe 10 times the mass of the sun. You have neutron stars form. So these are denser still. Again, they have a mass similar to that of the sun, but their size is something like 10 kilometers across. So roughly comparable to a city, for instance. So here's a neutron star compared to uh, the skyline of Chicago, which as John said, I, is where I did my PhD. 
And um, then on the most extreme side, these are stars that are 10, 50, 100 times as massive as the sun. The gravitational attraction of that central region is so strong that they collapse indefinitely and form something known as a black hole. So a black hole is called black because the gravitational attraction is so strong that nothing, including even light, can escape its pull. So this sort of characteristic black boundary you see, this is called the event horizon. This is the point of no return. So within that event horizon, the gravitational pull is so strong that light can no longer escape. So for a typical one of these black holes formed through the evolution of a massive star, the size of this event horizon is actually similar to that of a neutron star. It's about 10 kilometers or so across, about the size of a city. But of course, within that event horizon, the matter is compressed even further and, attain and attains infinitely high densities. It becomes quite exotic. So um, to give you sort of a, an additional illustration for how unbelievably dense these compact objects are, I want to do a quick little thought experiment. So there's maybe... Um, 300 or so people in the audience. So let's say I just take this middle group here, maybe 100 people. And let's say I have us all go gather and get into um, an elevator. I think there's an elevator over that way. So 100 of us, we go get in the elevator. So it'd be pretty tight fit, obviously. So the mass density of that elevator with 100 of us inside would be roughly comparable to the average mass density of the sun, okay? So if we wanted to make that elevator have a mass density comparable to a white dwarf, we'd have to take that same elevator and ask every single human on the Earth to come join us inside. So about 8 billion people. That would give us a white dwarf density. And if we wanted to go more extreme and attain a neutron star, we'd have to take the same elevator with 8 billion people inside and compress the elevator down to the size of a sugar cube or like the size of the tip of your thumb. Okay, so then we'd have a neutron star. And of course, the black hole is even denser yet. I don't even know what to compare it to. It's infinitely dense. So these objects are absolutely extreme. They're unlike matter of any of the kind that we are able to experience here on Earth. Okay, so with all this in mind, what I'd like to do next is take this information on these compact objects, these remnants of stellar evolution, and talk about these in the context of these globular clusters. The exciting thing that starts to happen is when you include black holes and neutron stars and globular clusters, all of those interesting interactions I showed before get even more interesting and exciting. Okay, so let's say here we're showing um, a very young cluster right after it was born. So maybe one of these young clusters that the James Webb Telescope is imaging. So a typical cluster, again, has about a million stars. And within this population of a million stars, you have some massive stars and mostly a lot of low mass stars. So very quickly, it only takes maybe a few million years, the most massive stars collapse into black holes. So the most massive stars, they evolve the quickest, they burn through their nuclear fuel the fastest, and they reach black holes, they reach their compact object state first. So for a typical one of these clusters with a million stars, you can expect around 1,000 black holes to form, roughly one black hole per 1,000 stars. Now these black holes, once they form, are very massive compared to the other stars in the cluster. And as a result of this, because they're so much more massive, the black holes very quickly sink to the center. So this is basically the same as if you, you know, took a glass of water and you put some honey or some other dense fluid inside, it would sink to the bottom. More massive, denser objects tend to sink to the bottom of a gravitational potential well. The same thing happens for these black holes. So the black holes form this dense subcluster in the central regions that is even higher density still from the overall stellar population of these clusters. Now on slightly longer timescales, the next most massive stars form neutron stars. So for a typical cluster, you might form maybe a few hundred to a few thousand neutron stars. And then on longer timescales still, the lowest mass stars, these are the ones that take the longest to evolve, slowly collapse into white dwarfs. So a typical cluster at present day, like the ones we see in the Milky Way, might contain something like 10,000 white dwarfs. But the vast majority of stars in a cluster are still just normal stars. These are stars that have not yet lived long enough to collapse into their final remnant. So these compact objects, even though in the case of white dwarfs you have 10,000 of these, still make up a small fraction of the overall stellar population.
Now, unlike the black holes, which are much more massive than the stars, the neutron stars and the white dwarfs have similar masses to all the regular bright stars that are still hanging around in the cluster. So that means the neutron stars and the white dwarfs, they don't really sink to the center like the black holes do. They kind of hang out in the outer parts of the cluster and mix around with the stars. So this basic structure, where you have all of the luminous stars out on the outside with the white dwarfs and neutron stars, and then this dense subcluster of black holes in the center, this is basically what we expect most globular clusters look like throughout most of their lives. So what I'd like to do next is zoom in on this central region where the black holes live and show a simulation of the interesting gravitational interactions that happen for the black holes themselves and also some stars that happen to wander in. So here again, we have a population of hundreds to maybe a thousand black holes that are whizzing around one another in the center of the cluster, as well as some stars that happen to also occupy this region. So a few things I want to point out in this simulation. So the first thing you'll notice is that occasionally you have stars that wander in, come too close to a black hole, and then get slingshotted out of the cluster center at very high velocity. So this is actually a natural consequence of these gravitational encounters. When an object that's lower mass comes close to a more massive object, it experiences a sort of gravitational slingshot effect. So the cumulative effect of these encounters is basically for the black holes, the more massive objects, to transfer energy into the lower mass luminous stars. Point number one. Okay, the second point. If you look closely, occasionally you'll see the black holes themselves get kicked out of the cluster. So the black holes are also interacting with other black holes, and as a result of these black hole plus black hole gravitational interactions, the black holes also kick one another around. So as a result of this, we expect the total number of black holes in the cluster to actually decrease over time. So you start with around 1,000, and then as the black holes interact with one another and kick each other out, the number slowly decreases until eventually nearly all of the black holes have been lost. And then the third final thing that I'll mention is that occasionally you'll see black holes pair up with other black holes and form these black hole plus black hole binaries. So these are really fun. I'll come back to this in a second. So um, for those of you in the audience who are maybe skeptics or you know, like to question some of the things we talk about, a very fair question may be, okay, well, these are really cool simulations, but black holes are black. We can't observe them. So how do you know I'm not just sort of messing around with my computer and creating these really pretty simulations? So um, to be honest, if you would have asked me maybe 20 years ago, are there really black holes in clusters? Do we really know? I would have said, I don't really know for sure. But in the past 10 years in particular, there has been a growing amount of observational evidence from a few different perspectives that show indeed globular clusters like the ones in the Milky Way do have black holes in their centers. So let me go through these pieces of evidence. So, as you saw in that previous simulation, occasionally the black holes interacted gravitationally with stars, and occasionally the black holes even paired up with stars and formed black hole plus star binary systems, like this one here. So, when a star happens to be gravitationally captured by a black hole, and as the star orbits around the black hole, the mathematical relations that determine this orbit are actually very well understood. They're basically the same equations that determine the orbit of the Earth around the Sun, for instance. So if we observe one of these stars orbiting some hidden, unseen object, if we observe the position and velocity of the star at different points around its orbit, we can sort of piece together the details of the orbit itself. We can figure out how wide the orbit is. We can figure out how long it takes the star to complete a single cycle. And from these relations, we can then use these orbital details to figure out the mass of that unseen hidden object. And of course, in the case of a black hole, indeed, this object is hidden by definition. You can't see it. So the idea then is if you observe particular stars that have high enough orbital velocities and particular orbital uh, variations, if that central object that you calculate has a high enough mass, then we know a black hole is there. Now, in practice, this is actually a really tricky observation because, for instance, for a given globular cluster, you have a million stars and you don't know going in which stars are orbiting black holes. 
So you have to basically look at every single star in the cluster and monitor them for a, you know, a while in time and hope you get lucky and catch the one or two that might be orbiting black holes. So it's actually a pretty difficult observation to take on. Uh, but in the past few years, so in 2018 specifically, we actually uh, detected for the first time a black hole in a binary orbit with a star inside a globular cluster. So this was actually the first ever stellar black hole identified through this method, either in a globular cluster or anywhere in the galaxy. So this particular black hole um, is in an orbit with um, a star actually pretty similar to the sun, has a similar mass to the sun, and it is found in the center of the Milky Way globular cluster, NGC 3201. So NGC 3201 is a pretty normal globular cluster. There's, there's nothing super weird about it. Um, I would say one of the more notable things is simply it happens to be nearby Earth. So that makes it a little bit easier to observe, which is, which is nice. So this particular black hole was found um, by a team using the uh, VLT instrument uh, down in Chile. And they uh, you know, announced this result. They published this paper with this you know, really amazing detection. And uh, this was right in the middle of my PhD when I was at Northwestern. So we saw this result and we got excited because we like to build models of globular clusters, you know, for fun. And we built a computer simulation of this cluster, NGC 3201, that included black holes. And we realized, oh wow, this simulation actually has more than one of these. It has like a handful at any given time, three or five or so. And we published our simulation result, and after our result, this team went back and did some follow-up observations, and they actually found two more black holes in this cluster. So two more of these black holes orbiting sun-like stars in the center of this globular cluster in the Milky Way. Okay, so this is method number one of how to observe black holes and clusters, by looking at the orbital velocity measurements of a stellar companion. Method number two also relies on this idea of a binary star system. So um, this method is kind of special because this is actually sort of the classic way of observing black holes. So back in the 1960s and 1970s, the first black holes were actually identified through this method. So what's happening here? Again, you have a star in an orbit with a black hole, but now the orbit is sufficiently compact. The stars are sufficiently close together that the black hole can strip matter off the outer layers of the star. And as this material falls onto the black hole and settles into this disk, the material gets heated up to really high temperatures and starts to shine really brightly as X-ray emission. So the idea then is you take your X-ray telescope and you identify these bright X-ray signatures from these binary systems and you say, okay, that's pointing to a black hole. So there have been a few dozen of these black hole X-ray binaries observed in the Milky Way in just the regular part of the galaxy, not in a globular cluster. And um, over the past 10 years, I think the first one was found in 2012, we've also identified these black hole X-ray binaries in globular clusters, again, in their centers, the same place those other black hole star binaries are living. So in total, we have found six of these in five different clusters. So one of them actually has two of these black hole X-ray binaries. So this is method number two of observing them. Now, um, if you think back to that simulation I showed a couple slides ago, um, you might remember that the fraction of stars, or I should say the fraction of black holes that were interacting with stars was a pretty small fraction of the overall black hole population. Most of the black holes were not really interacting with stars, or they were maybe interacting very briefly, very temporarily. Most of the stars, if you, most of the black holes, if you remember, were mostly sort of hanging out on their own. They were interacting briefly with stars or briefly with other black holes, but they were mostly just living as single black holes for most of their lives. So if most of the black holes in a cluster are singles, that may seemingly make them very hard to detect because again, a black hole on its own doesn't emit light. So in principle, this would make it very challenging. So, Indeed, this is true, but we have devised some indirect methods of probing this overall population of black holes at the centers of these clusters. So uh, this, this graphic here is showing something called the surface brightness profile of a globular cluster. So this measures basically the brightness per unit area versus distance from the cluster center. So if you look at one of these pictures of a globular cluster, this has been apparent in all of these pictures, I think. Clearly, the brightest part of the cluster is in the center. 
And indeed, when we look at this, um, this plot, we can see the brightness increasing as you move closer to the center of the cluster. Now, you see, though, that eventually, as you get close enough, the brightness sort of levels off. It becomes flat. So this flat part is actually what we call the core of the cluster. So you probably remember at the very beginning, I mentioned the typical core radius of a typical globular cluster is something like a parsec in size. So this is what the core is. This is actually how the core radius is defined. So the vast majority of the globular clusters that we observe in the Milky Way have a density profile, a brightness profile, that basically looks like this. The brightness increases toward the center, eventually it levels off where the core begins. This is like 80% of the clusters. But for the other clusters, roughly 20%, one out of every five, you have a slightly different profile. So for these clusters, the brightness increases toward the center, but it never levels off. It continues increasing all the way to the center. So these clusters don't have a core. We call these core collapse clusters. The brightness increases all the way, and the stars, there's nothing that's stopping the stars from segregating all the way into the centermost regions. Now, this distinction between the core clusters and the core collapse clusters is not entirely obvious. It's not entirely well known what causes some clusters to be core collapse and others not. Uh, but recently, a lot of us have begun to believe that this distinction is actually connected to the black hole populations themselves. So let me explain how this works. So as I showed in that simulation before, because of the fact that the black holes are so much more massive than the stars, and because the black holes are so dynamically active, the black holes effectively transfer energy into the stars as they interact with the stars. So this means that when you have a bunch of black holes in the center, the large amount of energy produced effectively heats the stars in the cluster. It causes the core to puff up. But as I also showed earlier, we expect the number of black holes to slowly decrease as the cluster evolves. And as the black hole number decreases, the energy generated by these black holes becomes less pronounced. And as you can see, then the core of the cluster starts to shrink. Eventually, all or nearly all of the black holes are ejected, and now the cluster is able to, con con uh, to obtain this cuspy shape in its profile. It's able to achieve this core collapse configuration. So we now expect that the clusters with large cores are the ones that still have a large percentage of their black holes remaining. And as the black holes are ejected, they no longer heat the stars as much and the cluster's core starts to collapse. But as I mentioned, roughly 80% of the clusters in the Milky Way still have very large cores. So this implies that the vast majority of the globular clusters that we observe today still have dozens to hundreds, maybe even thousands of black holes in their centers at present. So I think that's pretty exciting. Okay, so I mentioned this very briefly before, this point number three, the idea that occasionally you have black hole pairs find one another within the center of these clusters and form a black hole binary where a pair of black holes orbit one another. So let's talk a little bit about these in some more detail. So when you have a pair of black holes in an orbit with each other, the extreme gravitational fields of these black holes cause ripples in space and time called gravitational waves. And as this system emits these gravitational waves, these ripples in space, the gravitational waves actually remove energy from the orbit. They cause the pair of black holes to slowly spiral in towards one another until eventually they merge together. So this basic idea, this... Um, this idea that black holes would emit gravitational waves was actually first proposed about 100 years ago by Einstein. And the idea is if you can potentially observe these ripples in space, these gravitational waves here on Earth, then you can infer the presence of these inspiraling black hole binaries and learn about the black holes themselves. So potentially these gravitational waves are giving us another method of observing black holes. And um, as John mentioned very briefly in the intro, and as some of you may have heard, as of 2015, the astronomy community has unlocked the ability to detect gravitational waves. So this detection was made by this uh, huge science collaboration called LIGO, which stands for the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. 
So I'm not going to talk about how LIGO works. Um, what I will say is if you're interested, I would very much recommend looking it up because the technology used by LIGO, honestly, I think is more impressive than the actual detections made. The technology is really astounding. Um, but basically, LIGO is um, uh, an array of lasers that measures distortions of space and time as a gravitational wave signal passes through the Earth. So in September of 2015, the LIGO detectors, one in Louisiana, the other in Washington State, detected the in-spiral merger and ring down of a pair of black holes in the very distant universe, detected the gravitational waves emitted by this in-spiraling pair. So this was a huge event. It was 100 years in the making since Einstein first, hypo first hypothesi uh, hypothesized the existence of these gravitational waves. And it has completely sort of introduced a new way of observing the universe. So in 2016, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for this discovery, uh, which certainly points towards its impact on the field. And since this first detection about eight years ago, LIGO has now detected almost 100 binary black hole mergers that have occurred throughout the universe. So this graphic here is showing in blue all of the mergers that have been detected by LIGO sorted in order of the masses of the black holes that merge. So this vertical axis here on, uh, on the side here is showing the masses in units of the mass of the sun, solar masses. So on the low end, we see that we have these black holes that have masses of five to 10 times the mass of the sun. All the way up on the high end, we have black holes 50 to 100 to more than 100 times the mass of the sun. So a large range of different types of black holes that have been discovered through this new technique of gravitational wave astronomy. Now, despite all that we have learned from these black hole mergers that have been detected by LIGO, we still don't understand a very fundamental question, which is how these black hole binaries, these gravitational wave sources, formed in the first place. But one leading theory is that they were formed in the centers of globular clusters through these gravitational interactions between black holes that I've been discussing tonight. So there are a few different sort of pieces of evidence that suggest some of these may have formed in clusters. I'm going to talk about just one tonight. And that relies on the clues from these most massive black holes that have been observed by LIGO. So these are the black holes that have masses of at least 50 times the mass of the sun. This is maybe 10% of the overall population that have been observed. So how did these very massive ones form? So the massive black holes are especially interesting and mysterious because we actually thought before LIGO, based on our understanding of stellar evolution, that these massive black holes should not exist in nature. So this graphic here is showing in green the distribution of masses that have been observed by LIGO. And this gray region here, above roughly 40 solar masses, is the region where we expect a process called the pair instability to set in. So for the most massive stars, this pair instability process is expected to cause the stars to reach basically high enough temperatures to lead to a complete detonation of the stars when they collapse. So nothing would be left behind, no black hole, no neutron star, nothing. So because of this, we expect that there would be a gap in the mass function of black holes where this pair instability process sets in. So this is this gray boundary here on the right-hand side. But clearly, this green distribution extends into this region where we thought black holes shouldn't exist. So somehow these are being produced. The question is how? Well, one way you could produce these massive black holes is through previous mergers of black holes. So let's say, for instance, you have two 40 solar mass black holes, which are very normal, very easy to form through stellar evolution. And let's say you merge those 40s and you make an 80. Okay, that's fine. It's very reasonable. The trick, though, is getting that 80 to merge again, like the ones that LIGO has seen. Well, if that first merger happens in a dense environment like a globular cluster, then indeed that 80 solar mass merger product could potentially find another black hole. Because again, as you saw in those simulations, the black holes are constantly interacting with other black holes, giving them many chances to pair up again and potentially merge again. So we think that potentially these most massive black holes that have been observed by LIGO were formed through repeated mergers of black holes, two, three consecutive mergers that are occurring within the centers of these globular clusters. 
And indeed, just to drive this point home a little further, if we take a large set of simulations like the, to- like the kind that I, um, I perform on a daily basis, and we plot the distribution of black hole masses that merge in these simulations, we see that we indeed produce this nice tail that extends out to these higher masses. So potentially, these massive black holes are hinting at formation in globular clusters. Okay, so... This is where we stand today in this new field of gravitational wave astronomy. We've detected around 100 binary black hole mergers, and we've also detected a handful of neutron star mergers as well. So I haven't really talked about neutron stars much tonight. Um, Many would actually argue the neutron star mergers are more interesting than the black holes for different reasons, but this is a topic for another day. So this is where we stand today in 2023 just after the third observing run of LIGO has finished. So in the coming years and decades, as we move to advanced versions of LIGO and also new detectors like the Voyager detector and the Cosmic Explorer, the number of black hole mergers is expected to grow from the hundreds to the thousands, ultimately to the millions, when new detectors are able to be sensitive enough to essentially observe every black hole in the universe. So this is already an amazing field. We've already learned so much about black holes and the environments in which black hole binaries form. But over the coming years and decades, without a doubt, this new field of gravitational wave astronomy will continue to transform our field and how we study the universe. Okay, so we're about out of time. I thought that I would finish with a fun little thought experiment. So we've been talking about globular clusters and black holes and clusters, and all of the interesting interactions that happen when stars are living in these really dense environments. So I want to ask the following question. What would happen if you took the Earth and our solar system and you put it in a globular cluster? So uh, this here is a simulated view of what the night sky might look like from the center of a globular cluster. Okay, so obviously there's way more stars there than we're used to seeing. Now, you might think this would be a dream for astronomers. Look at all these stars we can observe. But it's actually kind of a nightmare because the night sky in one of these clusters would be over 20 times brighter than the night sky on a full moon here on Earth just because of the cumulative brightness of all these stars. So this would make it almost impossible to actually observe distant objects outside of the cluster except for the absolute brightest of objects. So it would actually be really difficult for a hypothetical planet in a cluster to learn about the outside universe. So that's kind of sad. To end on a more positive note, as I was talking, as I mentioned before, the closest star to us, to our sun, is is Proxima Centauri. It's about a parsec away. But in a globular cluster, where the stars are very densely packed, the average distance to the closest star for our hypothetical cluster planet would be over 100 times closer than Proxima Centauri is to our sun. It would be less than 1% of a parsec. So just as for reference, that distance is only about five times further away than the Voyager 1 spacecraft is from Earth today. So the Voyager 1 spacecraft is the most distant human-made object ever launched out into space. So Voyager 1 is nowhere near close to Proxima Centauri. It's not even 1% of the way there. But if Voyager had been launched from a hypothetical planet inside a globular cluster, it would actually be a pretty significant fraction of the way to the next closest star. So this means that potentially for planets in globular clusters, the prospects for sending spacecraft to nearby stars, maybe even nearby solar systems, is not entirely crazy. And I think that's kind of a fun thing to think about. So I uh, will leave you with that thought. Uh, Thank you again very much for being here, and I'm happy to answer some questions. We have microphones on the left, and I think there's one on the right. I can't see if there's... uh, Yeah, so if you have questions and can go up there and ask, we would prefer that if possible so that everybody can hear the questions. All right, that helps. They're too shy. Uh, 
<laughs> go ahead. So, uh, where do these rogue black holes go that have been shut out of the or, or zoom out of the globular clusters? So, um, as I was showing, the globular clusters live in the halo of the galaxy. So these black holes just get shot out into the halo. The halo. So clusters are really dense, but the halo is very sparse. It's like the least dense part of the galaxy. So once that once those black holes are kicked out. The story's over. You can't detect <laughs> They're them. They're wandering around in the halo. Um, I'm not going to say it's impossible to detect them because there's been... So I didn't talk about every way to observe black holes. One other way is something called gravitational lensing, where basically if the black hole passes between us and a nearby star, you, the star's light gets bent around the black hole. So potentially if you got really lucky and one of those wandering black holes happened to cross our line of sight with another star, you might be able to detect it through lensing. But the chances are pretty small. So I think I feel pretty confident saying those black holes are probably undetectable once they're, once they're kicked out. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have, let's, we'll just go back and forth. Before okay. Uh, back uh, you mentioned that M15 uh, was a uh, core collapsed globular cluster. And I, I thought that M15 kind of was one of the first in the news that they thought that there was a fairly massive black hole in the center of that. Uh, it, it did, am I kind of misunderstanding what you're saying, or was, has there been a change of thought about what's going on? Um, yeah, so I don't think I mentioned that M15 is core collapse, but I, you must have known that off the top of your head, so <laughs> that's impressive. <laughs> um, so yes, indeed, M15 is sort of one of the most well-known core collapse clusters. Um, it has a bunch of neutron stars that are very well observed, and there's been actually this is sort of one of the famous little pieces of history of globular cluster science. There's every few years um, a, um, an announced potential detection of a very massive black hole at the center of some globular clusters. So by massive, I mean not, you know, 100 times the mass of the sun, but thousands or 10,000 times the mass of the sun. So we call these intermediate mass black holes. So M15 has been one of the clusters potentially linked to these. Um, so... There's no strong observational evidence for these massive black holes in particular clusters. And I think the M15 case in particular has sort of been debunked. I think it's probably not the case. Um, but potentially some, some small, it's probably a small fraction of clusters in the Milky Way at least that have these massive black holes, but it could potentially be the case for some of them. So, um a globular cluster is about a million stars that are gravitationally bound, but how do you get a million stars to hang out close enough to each other to be gravitationally bound in the first place? Yeah, that's a really good question, and it's sort of, um, that's one of the things that sort of makes the Milky Way globular clusters not very useful, because they're really old. <laughs> they were formed, you know, 10 billion years ago, and we don't really know how they were formed. Uh, but what we do know is actually most, so if you look at like star forming regions in the Milky Way or other nearby galaxies, actually most stars are born in clustered environments. Clusters are stellar associations. So actually most stars are born in these clusters. Now a lot of these clusters end up dissolving and they sort of send their stars out into space. But for instance, there's some evidence that the sun itself was born in a cluster, probably not as dense as a globular cluster, but a cluster nonetheless that, later, that you know, eventually dissolved and sort of sent the sun and its other constituents out into space. So it's actually probably pretty, pretty normal that stars are born in these clusters. Um, the tricky thing is how to get these clusters to survive for billions, tens of billions of years, like the ones that we see at present day in the Milky Way. Yes, I think you mentioned that in one of the globular clusters that was inside the Milky Way, that some of the stars were very, very, very old. As in all of the clusters, that's all the case. Them. How, do, how does that relate to the development in time of the Milky Way? Um, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, it's not at all obvious how, so again, similar to the question I said before, it's not totally clear what the formation mechanisms of globular clusters are. And in fact, it's not even obvious that the clusters that we see currently in the Milky Way 
have always been in the Milky Way. So um, we know that there's constantly galaxies that merge together. And um, there's a lot of people who think, and I probably would agree with this, that actually the globular clusters we see in the Milky Way were originally born in lower mass galaxies. And when those lower mass galaxies merged, collided with the Milky Way, then the clusters basically became part of the Milky Way. Um, so, but it's a, it's a difficult problem, again, just because the clusters are so old. There's been so much time that's been elapsed between when they formed and when we observe them today, uh, which makes it, it makes it difficult to figure out, um, you know, the exact scenario through which they got there. Thank you. Yep. One more question. Um, so you said in 30 million years, the black, form, black holes form in a cluster, and in 100 million, then you get the neutron stars too. But you also said that the um, clusters that we see around the Milky Way, which are billions of years old, they still seem to all have their uh, black holes. So how long does it take for the black holes to escape a cluster? Yeah. Good question. So it, it depends on the cluster. So um, I, I showed the slide before where we were sort of linking the black hole populations with um, the core of the cluster. And we think that the clusters that still have relatively large cores, the really puffy clusters, simply have not yet evolved long enough to eject all of their black holes. So they still have a large fraction, maybe 10 or tens of percent of the black holes that they were initially born with. Whereas some clusters, we think probably the ones that were the densest initially, are able to evolve much more quickly. They're able to dynamically eject the black holes much more quickly so that by the present day, they've reached this core collapse configuration and all of the black holes have been kicked out. But at least going by the Milky Way clusters, we think that most of them, about 80% or so, have not yet evolved long enough to have ejected all of their black holes. So there's still a reasonable fraction of that initial population remaining in the center. Okay. Yes, uh, I'd like to know how you would describe the relationship between uh, the speed of light and the gravitational pull of a black hole, uh, if you will. Thank you. Yeah, so it's actually a very simple um, relation. So, um, I mean, if, if you wanted to calculate, so the Earth has some mass, and if you wanted to calculate you know, the velocity necessary to, you know, launch a rocket outside of the Earth's gravitational pull. It's just a simple equation based on the mass of the Earth. Um, and it's the same equation you would use to calculate the mass, the escape velocity of a black hole. And basically that radius is defined as the radius at which the escape velocity is exactly equal to the speed of light. That's what defines the event horizon. So does that mean that the... Uh gravitational pull of a black hole and it actually exceeds the speed of light? Is that what we're That's talking about The escape here? velocity of a black hole exceeds the speed of light. So that defines, is that a new uh, definition of uh, our reality or the uh, physical world? Or? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's just simply a way that black holes are defined. That's yeah. The fact that even lights can't escape is why, there are, why they, we call them black holes. So. Sure. Um, yeah, so it's actually really just taking the same type of escape velocity equations we use for rockets and applying it to a black hole, and voila, you realize you need to exceed the speed of light, and that's why light can't escape from a black hole, and they're black. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Regarding the origin of the globular clusters, whether they form with the Milky Way or not, it, can you observe them well enough to determine the orbits of the clusters around the Milky Way and use that as a way of determining whether they formed with the Milky Way or came from somewhere else? So you can absolutely observe the orbits. Um, and actually this um, relatively new mission called Gaia um, one of the really exciting things we've learned is we've actually very precisely measured the orbits of globular clusters around the halo of the Milky Way. Um, but it's not entirely obvious because the orbits change slowly over time. And what the orbits look like today are not necessarily what the orbits would have looked like a few billion years ago or what they would have looked like when maybe that globular cluster was first uh, became attached to the Milky Way. Um, so it's, 
I don't think necessarily obvious way, the, how the orbits would, it, would tell you whether or not they were born in the Milky Way or you know, born outside of the Milky Way. So there are globular clusters like in the plane of the Milky Way. Yep. So are they on highly eccentric orbits or are they sort of circular or there's a mix? Most, it's a mix, but I would say now this is actually one of the kind of cool things we've learned from this, this guy I mentioned that I mentioned. Most orbits, most of the clusters are actually on eccentric orbits, um, which is kind of cool because it means that occasionally they get really close to the galactic center and potentially then... So I showed those simulations of how stars can be stripped by black holes if they wander too close. Well, on a larger scale, if a globular cluster wanders too close to the center of the galaxy, it can actually also be stripped. And the cluster itself can be destroyed and the stars can become part of the, the bulge of the galaxy. I actually think this is how the galactic bulge probably formed from destroying a bunch of globular clusters that basically wandered too close to the center. Um, so... I maybe gave you more information than you asked for, but... No, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> Let's do one more question, and then if there's other questions, I'm sure Carl will be happy to stay and answer them. So, uh, my question is, uh, what happens, like, at the end of the life of a globular cluster? So, like, after all the black holes have been ejected? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we think we kind of know, because, again, in this picture I sort of was discussing... We think the core collapse clusters, which again, one out of every five in the Milky Way are core collapsed, we think have ejected all of their black holes. And um, so we think what probably happens then is now what's the next most massive thing in those clusters? Now it's the white dwarfs and the neutron stars. So we think those things now sink to the center and then they start to undergo their own gravitational encounters, sort of analogous to the ones the black holes, you know, featured before. So we think potentially in those core collapse clusters, instead of having lots of black hole mergers, you might start to get white dwarf mergers and neutron star mergers, just as an example. Thank you. This gentleman has so, such enthusiasm. Okay. <laughs> Taking a little bit off the track of black hole. Okay. I think most of the uh, observation today is based on finding exoplanets. And what I read recently was they have not found any exoplanets in globular clusters because of mental acidity environment. I don't know what that means, but maybe <laughs> you, you should enlighten it for us. And secondly, for most of you, with the age I'm looking at, if you look at, if you see the movie um, Nightfall, Black and, black and white movie created maybe when you, most of you were teenagers. It's a great movie about living inside a globular cluster. <laughs> Science fiction. Interesting relationship. <laughs> Who needs me when you can just go watch a movie? So, okay, so the question for those of you who couldn't hear was about, I, I, I asked for this one because I included my wild speculation about planets and globular clusters at the end. So the question was about, um, there's actually no, been not, there have not been yet any planets detected in globular clusters and why is this? And is this linked with something called metallicity? Um, okay, so I'll, Try to answer this in a few steps and not take too much time. So, metallicity. I didn't talk about metallicity. Metallicity is basically a measure of the metal content of stars. So, globular clusters, which are really old, they formed very early on in the universe when there were not many metals around. The universe was mostly just hydrogen and helium. So, globular clusters, the stars in these clusters are very metal poor. The sun, which is much younger, it was formed after many metals had been produced, is much more uh, metal rich than stars in a globular cluster. Now, metals are really useful when you start to talk about planets because we are made of carbon, okay? We're made of what astronomers call metals. The Earth is made of metals, mostly. So if you want to produce planets like Earth, you need to have metals. And that kind of suggests that when you're looking at a really low metallicity environment like a globular cluster, it might kind of be really difficult to form 
for example, rocky planets. Now, maybe you could form gas planets like Jupiter. Jupiter has, um, is much more hydrogen helium based than the Earth. Um, but this process of planets, this idea of planet formation, is certainly connected with metallicity. So there have not yet been planets detected in, in globular clusters. Maybe it's because their low metallicity prevents planet formation. Um, but I think probably it's actually just because um, the globular clusters are far away, and importantly, because they're so high density, it makes doing any type of really sensitive observations, and doing exoplanet detections is, requires very sensitive observations. Uh, it, it would just be very hard to see planets in clusters. Uh, but certainly, I mean, essentially every star that we observe nearby has planets. They're very common features, including in low metallicity stars that are nearby that aren't in clusters. So we think it's quite natural that some of the stars in clusters could have been born with planets, but there's no, no observational evidence, unlike the black holes, which there is strong observational evidence for. Okay, excellent. Um, that means you remind everybody the tickets for uh, the lecture in two weeks go on sale tomorrow. Well, they're free, but they're available tomorrow at 10 a.m., so grab your tickets for that for Jane Rigby and we're going to If you have questions, Kyle will be happy to answer more questions if you have them. Please come on up. Thank you.